Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about the calendar. First, happy solstice, because you're not listening to this on the solstice, but we are recording it on the solstice. <laughs> <laughs> so I wish you a happy solstice from the past. By now, the sun is coming back. That's true. So yeah, we're going to be talking about a video from the past year, last year? year last before? year. Last year. That's all about the calendar and the names of the months and weekdays, basically. Mm -hmm. But before we get to that, only a couple of little things. One is we now have some posters available on Redbubble, which are new. We've had some merchandise like that in the past, but and we haven't taken that stuff down. But we now have a Redbubble store. And specifically, we have the magic poster there and spelling at the moment. And when I say poster, I mean the, the, the main image from a video that we've done with all of the different connections on it made into a printable poster. So if you're interested in such things, you can go to endlessknot.redbubble.com to look at that. And we are going to add other videos there too, and maybe some other merch. If there's anything in particular you'd like, please let us know because we'll only be doing it when we have time. But if there's some particular demand, there was a number of people asking about the magic one, which is why we've done it. Also, over the last, in November, we hit 30,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel which was very exciting. We are, as of this moment, a little over 35,000. November was a very big month for us for slightly confusing and unknown reasons, but we got a lot of new subscribers. So welcome to any new subscribers who made your way to the podcast. And because of that, we are planning to do what we've done in the past for Big Milestones, which is a live stream Q&A. However, it all came sort of so fast and unexpectedly that we just didn't have time. So we're going to do it in the new year, hopefully fairly soon in the new year. What that means is it'll be on YouTube and we'll be answering questions in real time. We will post our information about that on all our social media if you're interested. But if you want to ask us any questions and have us answer them, have Mark answer them probably, most people always want him <laughs> to answer things about words, you can email them to us or tweet them at us or leave them as comments on the community tab on our YouTube channel. So please do if you're interested in that. And we will try to make sure that you know when we're doing the live stream. So since it's the solstice, we are having our traditional solstice drink. We were going to have it in any case. And since we're recording tonight, that is our beverage of choice. Mold apple cider. And, you know, traditionally, I suppose one would spike it with brandy. However, we have a special liqueur to doctor our mold apple cider with which is a new spirit from our local craft distiller, Crosscut. And it's called Clove's Optional Holiday Spirit. <laughs> and so it's got the, you know, what you would expect as the traditional Christmas, Christmas time spices. spices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's cloves and cinnamon and allspice, I guess. Yeah. But very cloves forward. Yeah. So it's... It's a nice addition to the mold cider, which already had cloves in it, of course. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So cheers. Mm -hmm. Not really a cocktail, I suppose, but a warming beverage. We always have hot cider on the solstice and usually have big parties. In the past, it was my family. And then the last 10 years, it's been friends of ours in our hometown. We always go back for solstice, but this year we're not going anywhere for Christmas. Mm -hmm. Those of you in the distant future, this is being recorded in 2020. Yes, the year we all stayed home. <laughs> so we are not able to have our solstice celebrations with our family and our friends, but we've had a few Zoom calls and we're at least going to have the food. Yeah. Because if nothing else, we'll have the food and drink. <laughs> really, we're not doing too badly. So that's all the prelude we have. Do you want to say a couple words about the video before we watch it? Yeah. So this video is not only our seasonal Christmas episode -y thing. It's actually, well, it mentions some, some Christmassy stuff, but it's about the calendar in general. And it kind of also was maybe more specifically a New Year's special mm -hmm. this time around, talking about the calendar and the turn of the year and all of that sort of thing. 
It also is the third part of a series of videos about calendrical topics, the first of which was about the word Sabbath, the second about millennial, and this one about calendar. So it, it forms a kind of trilogy of videos about, about that sort of stuff. And we will eventually get to around to making podcasts of <laughs> those first two parts, but we're doing this one now right away for our seasonal podcast. Mm -hmm. So in, in the script, as we will hear, you do refer back to those videos a couple of times, yeah. but just think of it as being referring forward because time is wibbly wobbly. That's right. Okay, good. Well, then we'll listen to that. We'll, we'll, I'll play the voiceover for calendar and then we will reconvene and talk about just, just a couple of additional things. This, this video is very focused in some ways, in, in a way that sometimes ours are not, but there's a couple of additions that we wanted to make. The history of calendars can be traced back to the urban revolutions, when humans began to shift from small communities to large cities in the Bronze Age. These complex cities led to things like writing, currency, and standardized weights and measures, which allowed for financial transactions and taxation, and calendars soon followed, which not only regulated human time, important for agriculture and taxation, but also religious time, important for festivals and other observances. First came the Sumerian lunar solar calendar, which was organized by both the solar and lunar cycles, followed by independent calendar systems developed in other parts of the world, such as the Egyptian solar calendar, early solar calendars in China, and the famously complex Mayan calendar in Mesoamerica, which led to the famous 2012 millenarian phenomenon because of the mistaken belief that the Mayan calendar predicted the end of the world in that year. In fact, it was really just the end of a 5,126 year long cycle tracked in their calendar, important but not apocalyptic. The word calendar actually comes from the Roman calendar, in which the first day of the month was named the calendi or calends, traditionally spelled with a K, even though the letter was very rare in classical Latin, from calare to call summon, being the day when the priests would announce the new moon and declare the number of days, five or seven depending on the month, until the next named day, the noni or nones, meaning literally nine, which if you count inclusively, that is, counting both the day you start with and the day you end on, is nine days before the the next name day, the Idus or Ides, as in the famous Ides of March when Julius Caesar was assassinated, etymology unknown but perhaps Etruscan, coming on either the 13th or 15th of the month, and all the other days of the month were simply counted back inclusively from those named days. Those named days, by the way, were likely originally there to mark the phases of the moon. For the Romans, the word year was annus, from which we get annual, ultimately from the Proto-Indo-European root at, to go, thus indicating the idea of the period of time gone through. The English word year comes from Old English yar, ultimately from the Proto-Indo-European root yer, meaning year or season, which also came into Greek as hora, season, which eventually found its way into English in the words horoscope and hour, indicating a very different unit of time. The word for month in most languages is usually connected to the word for moon, since a month was originally at least a cycle of the moon. The Romans called the month mensis, and our English word month, related to moon, comes from Old English monath, and all these words can be traced back to the Proto-Indo-European root me to measure, also source of words such as measure, meter, moon, and menstruate. We've already explored the details of the Babylonian and Jewish calendars and how lunar, solar, and lunisolar calendars work in our previous videos on the words Sabbath and Millennial. So if you want to learn even more about those topics, check them out. But to briefly summarize the key issues relevant to our modern calendar, the modern secular calendar is strictly solar, which keeps in sync with the solar cycle, determined by our Earth's orbit around the Sun, so that the solstices, when the day or night is at its longest, and the equinoxes, when the day and night are the same length, occur at the same time every year. But as I mentioned before, there are other natural cycles that can be used in organizing a calendar, such as the daily cycle determined by the rotation of the Earth, and the lunar cycle or lunation determined by the Moon's orbit around the Earth. The problem is none of the cycles line up properly. The year can't be divided up into an even number of lunations. There's about 29.53 days in a lunation and about 12.38 lunations in a solar year. So lunisolar calendars that track both cycles have to cheat by adding in extra days or months here and there to reconcile the different cycles, what are known as intercalary days or months. Intercalary meaning inserted into the calendar, from Latin inter, between, and that same root as calendar. 
And in fact, the year can't even be broken down into an even number of days. It's actually 365.24 days, hence the need for leap years. Now although our secular calendar is not dependent on lunations, only needing to reconcile the daily and yearly cycles, since our modern calendar was in part developed by the Christian Church based on the Roman calendar and the Jewish calendar, we do also have to bear in mind the lunar cycle when we look at its history. The seven day week seems to have originally derived from the phases of the moon in the Babylonian calendar, which was then transformed in the Jewish calendar to a simple repeating seven day cycle ending on the Sabbath, no longer tied to the lunar phases. But the Jewish calendar was nevertheless still a lunisolar calendar, and so festival days also depended therefore on lunation. And since the Christian tradition was based on Judaism, some of the Christian festivals are also based on the lunar cycle. This is why in the ecclesiastical calendars, sometimes referred to as calendar with a K in that ancient Roman tradition, there are movable feasts based on the lunar cycle and fixed feasts based on the solar cycle. This is why Christmas, a fixed feast, occurs on the same date every year, but Easter, a movable feast, based on the lunar cycle, moves around. So today we're going to focus on how we got our modern international calendar with the months and weekdays we know and love, and to do that we have to start with classical Rome. The old Roman calendar system originally had only 10 months, starting with March and ending with December, with a number of intercalary days after December to reconcile the calendar with the solar year. And later on, these intercalary days were replaced with two new months, January and February, and the start of the year was eventually moved to the beginning of January. But this is why the months September, October, November, and December, which etymologically come from the Latin numbers Septem 7, Octo 8, Noem 9, and Decem 10, are no longer the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th months. That original Roman calendar was modified over and over again, with the length of months becoming fixed so that they no longer represented lunar cycles, and it was brought more in line with the solar cycle, for instance by adding leap days as we have it now. Every year divisible by 4 contains a leap day, unless the year is divisible by 100, in which case it isn't a leap year, unless the year is divisible by 400, in which case it is a leap year again. Got that? It was the Roman Julius Caesar who had that unlucky day in March who originally added the leap year every four years, in the year 46 BCE, hence it's called the Julian calendar. But since the year is slightly less than 365 and a quarter days long, Pope Gregory XIII promulgated the current more complex system of leap years in 1582, hence our calendar now is called the Gregorian calendar, though it was actually the work of physician and astronomer Aloysius Lilius, with further refinements by Jesuit German mathematician and astronomer Christopher Clavius, who by the way first introduced brackets in mathematics and was one of the first to use the decimal point in the west. But that explains why historical dates are sometimes messed up. Because in order to get the calendar back on track from the 10 day difference that had built up since the Julian calendar started being used, in 1582 October 4th was followed immediately by October 15th. And to make matters worse, only Catholic countries adopted the new calendar in 1582, with Protestant and Orthodox countries only adopting it some time later, leading to many discrepancies. Britain didn't adopt the new calendar until 1752, by which point the slippage had increased to 11 days, so in Britain in 1752 September 2nd was followed by September 14th, and of course many at the time complained about the loss of those 11 days. You can imagine this would be a financial problem, calculating things like interest for insurance. Some Orthodox churches are still a number of days out, which is why Orthodox Christmas is on January 6th, though most traditionally Orthodox countries have switched to the Gregorian calendar for secular purposes, but often only relatively recently, with Russia switching only in 1918 and Greece as late as 1923. The other confusing element about historical dates is the fact that the date of New Year's Day, when the numerical year would tick over, kept switching around. Julius Caesar moved it from March to January 1st, once those new months were created, but under the influence of Christianity it was often moved to various days of religious importance, such as Christmas, the Annunciation in March, or Easter, but the Gregorian reform moved it back to January 1st, and non-Catholic countries often only switched once they adopted the new calendar. All this is, for instance, why the Russian October Revolution actually took place in November. So as we've seen, the names September, October, November, and December are simply derived from the Roman numbers, and those are by the way cognate with our English numbers, coming from the Proto-Indo-European numbers Septem, Octo, Noon, and Decem respectively. The burr ending on those months by the way is of uncertain etymology, 
it might be related to mensis, month, which would then have produced a form mensris and then membris, or it might simply be from the Latin adjectival suffix bris, from the noun suffix bra or brum, ultimately from the Proto-Indo-European noun forming suffix drum. But what about the other months of the year? Well, let's start with January, or Januarius in Latin, which is named after the two-faced god of doorways, Janus, very appropriate for the newly instituted first month of the year. The name Janus, or actually Janus in Latin, is related to the word Janua, door, which gives us English janitor, who was originally a doorkeeper, and comes from the Proto-Indo-European root a, to go, which might lie behind the root year, and would thereby be related to the word year, also appropriate. Now the early Germanic peoples had their own calendar system too, and some of those old month names continued to be used for quite a while before being replaced by the Roman names. So in Old English, December and January roughly coincided with Yolamonath or Yule month, in reference to the old pagan festival Yule, now associated with Christmas, and later it was divided up into two months, Ara Yolamonath, before Yule month for December, and after Yolamonath, after Yule month for January. And you can learn more about the etymology and significance of Yule in our Yule video. You'll love it! Next up is February, the other new month that the Romans added to their originally ten month calendar. Since Februarius was the last month in the Roman calendar until the first month was changed from March to January, there were a number of Roman festivals then that were concerned with endings and boundaries, such as Parentalia, which involved honouring ancestors and propitiating the dead, and Terminalia, a festival in honour of Terminus, the god of boundaries. Another festival in Februarius was the purification ritual known as Februa or Lupercalia, and it's from this that the month takes its name. Februa is the plural form of februum, meaning means of purification or expiatory offerings, presumably some sort of instrument used in the purification ritual. In his calendar poem called the Fasti, Ovid suggests the word comes from an ancient tongue, presumably Etruscan or possibly Sabine, another Italic language related to Latin but ultimately the etymology of the word is unknown. It might come from the Proto-Indo-European root degua, to burn or warm, also the source of the word fever, or the root deu, dust, vapour, smoke, also the source of the word fume, either way suggesting a ritual involving fire and or smoke. In the Germanic calendar, February is equivalent to Solmonath, which the Venerable Bede in his De Temporum Ratione, or The Reckoning of Time, explains means month of cakes, because the English used to offer cakes to their old Germanic gods in that month, though some scholars have suggested that instead it might mean mud month, since mud is the usual meaning of the word soul, and that time of year is particularly wet in the climate of England. Bede, by the way, was one of the foremost Latin writers in early medieval England, and his De Temporum Ratione, which not only gives and explains the Latin and Old English names of the months, but also the Hebrew and Greek names, is a work of computus, that is the calculation of the calendar and specifically the calculation of the date of Easter, which moves around every year since it's based on a lunar calendar unlike most of the rest of the Christian calendar. There was a controversy about the method of calculating Easter just prior to Bede's time, revolving around whether the English should calculate Easter following the methods of the church in Rome, or following the Irish church's method. Bede was a staunch supporter of the Roman church, so the climactic moment of Bede's most famous work, Historia Ecclesiastica Gentis Anglorum, or Ecclesiastical History of the English People, was when the Synod of Whitby decided in favour of the Roman method of calculation, as well as the Roman form of tonsure, or monastic haircut, instead of the Irish. The other thing Bede's Historia Ecclesiastica achieved was the popularization of the system of BC and AD years, which we discussed in the Millennial video. As for the calculation of Easter, it was originally tied to the Jewish Passover, the Last Supper of Jesus and his disciples before the crucifixion is presented, at least in some parts of the New Testament, as a Passover Seder. But because Passover moves around so much in relation to the solar Roman calendar, and also because the early Christian church wanted to distance themselves from Judaism, their calculation is instead based on the equinox and the full moon, that is the Sunday following the full moon which falls on or after the equinox, though even that isn't exactly how the calculation works. Now moving on to March, or Martius in Latin, this month is named after the Roman god of war, Mars, which was appropriate since it was typically the opening of the military campaign season, who is held to be the progenitor of the Roman people, as father of the legendary founders of Rome, Romulus and Remus, and who became associated with the Greek god of war, Ares. 
This is a process known as syncretism, when one tradition is understood by interpretation and comparison to another tradition. In this case, Romans reinterpreted their native gods by comparison to the Greek gods, reconciling the two traditions. Thus it is specifically known as Interpretatio Graeca. So since Mars was understood as a god of war, he was seen as equivalent to the Greek Ares who had the same role, and thus the Romans borrowed the rich tradition of mythological stories associated with Ares. The word syncretism, by the way, has a surprising etymology, coming from Greek syncretismos from the prefix syn with together, and a debated second element, possibly the name of the island of Crete, because the earliest attested use of Greek syncretismos is to refer to a federation of Cretan communities, though some have also suggested a connection to Greek crassus, mixture. As for the name Mars, its source is uncertain, but it may be connected to the Etruscan god Maris. As for Mars himself, he seems to have originally been a thunder god, not a god of war, and may descend from an old Indo-European god of thunder and oak trees, Perkunos meaning literally oak, also the source of the Germanic god Thor, though the name Perkunos was transferred to Thor's mother, Thjörgyn. The connection between thunder and oak may be that lightning has a tendency to strike the very tall oak trees. As for the name of the month of March in the Germanic calendar, Hrethmonath, this refers to a different god, Hrethe to whom Bede tells us the English sacrificed at this time. We know nothing more about this goddess, but her name seems to mean either victorious or famous, related to Old English Hreth, glory in battle or victory, and from the same root as the first element in the names Rudolph, literally famous wolf, and Roger, famous spear. Next is April or Aprilis in Latin, which marks the beginning of spring, and one traditional etymology reflects this with Aprilis coming from Latin aperire, to uncover, open, from Proto-Indo-European apo, off, away, and where, to cover, since all the plants open up at this time of year. Ovid mentions this etymology, but also provides a different derivation, that since it is the month of the goddess of love, Venus, with her festival on the Kalends, the name comes from her Greek equivalent Aphrodite. This could make sense coming through Etruscan apru, a borrowing of the shortened version of her Greek name Afro. Now the name Aphrodite is itself of uncertain origin, but Ovid goes on to mention the usual Greek understanding of her name that it comes from Greek Aphros, foam, because of the myth of her origin from sea foam produced by Uranus's genitals when his son Cronus cut them off and threw them into the sea. The word Aphros in turn might come from the Proto-Indo-European root Neb, cloud, also the source of Nebula, Nimbus, and Neptune, the Roman sea god who became syncretized with Greek Poseidon. The second element of Aphrodite might be related to Greek deato, seemed, appeared, and delos, clear, visible, also the source of the second element in psychedelic, from Proto-Indo-European dieu to shine, suggesting she might originally have been a dawn goddess. More recent arguments, however, derive Aphrodite's name from a pre-Greek language, as the goddess herself seems to be largely influenced by eastern cults of the Phoenician Astarte, cognate with Babylonian Ishtar, herself influenced by Sumerian Inanna, so a lot of syncretism going on there. A completely different etymology for the name of the month Aprilis is that it might come from an otherwise unattested form Aprilis, meaning the following, the next ultimately from that same Proto-Indo-European Apo, since it was the second month in the older Roman ten-month calendar. According to Bede, the Germanic name for April is Eostromonath, or Easter month, named after an old Germanic goddess Eostra, who is celebrated in that month. The Germanic name was then borrowed to refer to the Christian festival of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. Most non-Germanic languages refer to Easter with some form of the Semitic word for Passover, which in Aramaic is Pascha and Hebrew Pesach, literally he passed over, in reference to the story in Exodus in which the Spirit of God passed over the homes of the children of Israel in Egypt while inflicting the tenth plague of death on the Egyptian firstborn. Thus, for instance, the word for Easter in French is Pac, in Italian Pasqua, and in Spanish Pasqua, but in German it's Ostern. As for the goddess Eostra, we don't know very much about her, though the name is attested in the month names of a number of other Germanic languages, as well as in some place names and other fragmentary evidence. Etymologically, it seems to be traceable back to the Proto-Indo-European root aus, to shine, also the source of the word east, and thereby identified as the descendant of a Proto-Indo-European dawn goddess, Hausos, also the source of the Roman goddess Aurora, the Greek goddess Eos, the Vedic goddess Usas, and the Lithuanian goddess Ausrine. 
Next up is May or Maius in Latin, named after the Roman earth goddess Maya, who might be related to, or have become conflated with, the Greek goddess of the same name. The Greek Maya was the daughter of the Titan Atlas, and the mother of Hermes, equivalent to Roman Mercury. The Roman Maya is also said to be the wife of the blacksmith god Vulcan, equivalent of the Greek Hephaestus. Maya also became connected with the mystery cult goddess referred to as Bona Dea, meaning good goddess, though her actual name was only known to women, so the Roman male authors didn't know much about her or the rituals associated with her. The Roman saw Maya as a goddess of growth, deriving her name from the comparative adjective Maius Maior, larger or greater, from which we get the word major. The Greek word Maya, on the other hand, was an honorific term for older women, perhaps derived from mater, mother. However, both the Greek and Latin names might simply mean she who is great, from the Proto-Indo-European feminine form of magia, from the root meg, which is, in any case, the root that lies behind Latin Maius. Bede tells us that the Germanic name for May is three milchomonath, literally three milk month, because in that month cows can be milked three times a day. June, or Junius in Latin, was the last originally named month in the old Roman calendar, the rest simply being numbered. Ovid has three different goddesses claiming the month is theirs, giving three possible etymologies for Junius. In the first, the one that most modern etymologists agree with, the goddess Juno, wife of Jupiter, syncretized with Greek Hera and Zeus, says the month is named after her. The name Juno either comes from that same root dieu, meaning to shine, that we saw in connection to Aphrodite, with the sense sky or heaven, plus enes, burden, from which we get the word onus, thus forming a compound meaning having heavenly authority or from the root yeu, vital force, youthful vigour, which also gives us the words youth and young. Then the goddess of youth and rejuvenation, Uentas, says the name comes from junior, young person, from which we get the word junior, in contrast to maiores, or elders, which she says is the actual source of the name of the month Maius. This etymology would also ultimately come from the root yeu. And finally, the goddess of marriage and society, Concordia, says the name comes from Jungera, to join, in honour of her uniting the Romans and the Sabines. Latin Jungera comes from the Proto-Indo-European root Yeug, to join, which also gives us the words join, yoke, yoga, through Sanskrit, because yoga involves the joining with the supreme spirit. Another theory is that it comes from the name of the Unia clan, either Marcus Junius Brutus who made the first sacrifice to the goddess Carna on the Calends of June, or Lucius Junius Brutus, the founder of the Roman Republic who overthrew the last of the Etruscan kings and became one of the first consuls of Rome. The clan name Unia is probably itself connected with the goddess Juno. B tells us that both June and July are called Liva, from Live, mild because both months are mild and feature gentle breezes, suitable for navigating on the sea. Ultimately the word comes from the Proto-Indo-European root lento, meaning flexible, also the source of the words lithe and relent. Now it's interesting that we just mentioned Marcus Junius Brutus, because there's another, more famous Marcus Junius Brutus, who is connected with the month of July. July was originally called Quintilis, just meaning the fifth month but was renamed in honour of Julius Caesar in 44 BCE, and the sixth month, originally Sextilis, was renamed Augustus in honour of Caesar's adoptive son, the first emperor of Rome, in 8 BCE. You see, when Julius Caesar was making his power grab, people were worried he would make himself king and end the republic, and so there was a conspiracy to assassinate him. One of the conspirators, as you may remember from Shakespeare's play, was Marcus Brutus. Et tu, Brute? Brutus's full name was Marcus Junius Brutus, also a member of the Unia clan, and purported descendant of Lucius Junius Brutus, who founded the Republic. So as you can imagine, Marcus Brutus, most definitely an honourable man, felt a certain pressure to defend that Republic. The Julius of Julius Caesar is another of those clan names, the Gens Julia, and it was probably a contraction of Old Latin Ioilios, pertaining to or descended from Jove, Jove being another form of the name Jupiter. Jove goes back to that same root dieu, to shine, which has a number of derivatives in various Indo-European languages that mean either sky or god, such as Latin deus, god, and Greek Zeus, suggesting the existence of an Indo-European god dieus, who would have been the father of the dawn goddess Hausos. Jupiter is derived from a vocative compound, dieus pater, meaning something like O Father Jove. 
Augustus was actually an honorific given to the first emperor, who was born Gaius Octavius Thurinus, meaning august or venerable, and either comes from Latin augura to increase, from the Proto-Indo-European root aug to increase, also the source of augment and wax as in a waxing moon, or might be related to augur as in augury, fortune telling through birds, which itself might come from the root aug, or might come from the root awi, bird also the source of the words aviary and egg. For the English it was weod month, literally weed month, though more broadly and accurately plant month, because as Bede tells us they grow more abundantly in that month. Now as we've already said, September through December are just numbered months. According to Bede, September was called Halimonath, holy month, but it is also called harvest monath, harvest month, according to another early English writer Alfrich. October was called Winterfuleth, literally winterful, because as Bede explains, winter begins on the full moon of that month. November is called Blotmonath, meaning sacrifice month or blood month, because cattle were to be slaughtered and sacrificed to the gods then. And if you want to know more about that, and the names of the seasons, you can check out our video on the word feast. And finally, as we've already seen, December is part of Yolamonath. Moving down from the month we have the week, which roughly represents the four phases of the moon. Another numerical reason for the seven day week is perhaps the fact that the year breaks down into 52 weeks plus one day. The word for week in European languages is usually related to the number seven, as in Greek hebdomas and Latin septimana, from septem, from which comes French semaine and Spanish semana. The English word week, on the other hand, is a Germanic derived word from Old English wuku ultimately from Proto-Indo-European wake to bend or wind, which also gives us the other word week, probably in the sense of turning or succession, though there's no clear evidence that it referred to a period of seven days in Germanic culture until after the influence of the Roman week. The Romans themselves didn't originally have a week in their calendar system, as we've seen it was really organized by counting back from the various name days, though they did have an eight day market cycle. We have to go back to Babylonian astrology to really understand where the weekday names come from. You see, the Babylonians associated the planets visible to the naked eye, since there were no telescopes back then, with the gods, and this may have inspired the Hellenistic Greek astrologers. Some of them even seem to line up in syncretic associations, with the chief Babylonian god Marduk associated with the planet Jupiter, and the goddess of love, beauty, and sex, Ishtar, whom we've already seen connected with Aphrodite, associated with the planet Venus. For the Hellenistic astrologers there were seven planets, since they included the moon and sun, which moved across the sky relative to the fixed stars. And eventually these seven classical planets became associated with the seven days of the week, which were eventually adopted by the Romans from Hellenistic Greece, and called Dies Solis, day of the sun, or Sunday, Dies Lunae, day of the moon, or Monday, Dies Martis, day of Mars, or Tuesday, Dies Mercurii, day of Mercury, or Wednesday, Dies Jovis, day of Jove, or Thursday, Dies Veneris, day of Venus, or Friday, and Dies Saturni, day of Saturn or Saturday. But why this order? Well, the order that they placed the planets in in terms of distance from the sun was based on their apparent speed moving across the sky, so in order of slowest to fastest, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, Moon, called the Chaldean order. But that's not the order of the days of the week. The answer lies not in assigning the planets to the days of the week directly, but in assigning them to the hours of the day, called planetary hours, in which each planet slash god had power over that hour, and there's some evidence to suggest that the Hellenistic astronomers got this idea from the Babylonians as well. If you start with Saturn on the first hour of the first day, and cycle through all the seven planets in the Chaldean order, then start over with Saturn on the eighth hour, and so on, and then continue that pattern hour by hour over the seven days of the week, each day will begin with a different planet in the order of the days of the week, as we've just seen in the Latin names. Now let's look at the etymology of each day specifically. First of all, Sunday or Dies Solis in Latin, originally Hemera Heliu in Greek, which was later rendered Sunandai in Old English and Sunudagar in Old Norse, with all of those words for the sun and correspondingly for the personification of the sun in each pantheon, with Sol in Latin and Helios in Greek coming from the same Proto-Indo-European root Sawal, sun. The word helium by the way comes from that Greek word because the element helium was first detected in the sun through spectroscopic observation of a solar eclipse. 
Now you might assume that the words for day are all related too, but surprisingly not. First of all, Greek hemera, from which we get the English word ephemeral, comes from the Proto-Indo-European root amer, day, whereas English day, from Old English die, comes from an unrelated root, probably og, day, though the initial d in the Germanic forms is hard to account for, or degwa, to burn warm, which we've already seen as possibly lying behind the month name February. And though the Latin dies looks superficially similar to English day, it actually comes from that root dieu meaning to shine. Now in Romance languages derived from Latin, that original name connected to the sun was replaced with forms derived from Latin dies domini, day of the lord, so domingo in Spanish and dimanche in French. From Monday, or monadai in Old English and monadagger in Old Norse, we've already seen that moon, as well as month, come from may meaning measure. Latin luna, from which we get lunar, comes from the Proto-Indo-European root leuc, light or brightness, also the source of light, illuminate, and lucid. And from Latin dies lunae come French lundi and Spanish lunes. And Greek selene, moon, is related to selas, light, from the root swell to shine, burn, also the source of English sultry and swelter. The Roman goddess Luna, by the way, was said to be the sister of the sun god Sol and the dawn goddess Aurora, who also, as we've seen, might be related to the Germanic goddess Eostra. Now things start to get particularly interesting with Tuesday, which is dies martis, or day of Mars in Latin, which leads to French mardi and Spanish martes. The Greek equivalent, of course, is Hemera Areos, or day of Ares, the Greek god of war, whose name comes from the Greek word are, bane, ruin, curse perhaps from Proto-Indo-European ace, which seems to mean to move rapidly, and is found in words denoting passion, also leading to such words as ire, iron, and estrogen. Through the process of Interpretatio Germanica, the Roman war god became associated with the Germanic war god Tiwaz, who becomes Tyr in Old Norse and Tiu in Old English, thus producing the weekday names Tiesdager in Old Norse and Tiwazdai in Old English, leading to modern English Tuesday. Interestingly though, Tiwaz was not originally a god of war, but instead descends from the Proto-Indo-European god Dieus, who also lies behind Zeus and Jupiter. Tiwaz may originally have been a more prominent god in the Germanic pantheon, but his role seems to have been usurped somewhere along the line by the god Odin, who is the subject of our next day of the week. Wednesday, from Old English Wodnesdai, is named after the Germanic god Woden, more famously known by the Old Norse form of his name, Odin, hence Old Norse Odinsdagger. This is a syncretic rendering of Latin dies Mercurii, day of Mercury, which becomes French Mercredi and Spanish Miercoles. But what's the point of comparison between the chief Norse god and Mercury, the Roman equivalent of Hermes, the Greek messenger god? Well, one of Hermes' responsibilities was to guide the souls of the dead to the afterlife, a position called a psychopomp. Odin too is associated with the dead, playing host in Valhalla in the afterlife to warriors who died in battle. Also, when Odin travelled amongst humans on Midgard, he wore a broad-brimmed hat and cloak and carried a staff, which was visually similar to the appearance of Hermes, who was also a god of travellers, merchants, and commerce. The name Hermes is probably connected to the Greek word herma, heap of stones, boundary marker, because of the god's associations with travellers, but the ultimate etymology of that word is unknown, possibly from a non-Indo-European root, though a connection to the Proto-Indo-European root ser to line up bind together has been suggested. Interestingly, Hermes is thought to have originated as a form of the Greek pastoral god Pan, taking on the boundary marking associations and leaving Pan with the rustic associations. Pan is thought to descend from an original Indo-European god Pauson, with the name ultimately coming from the root pu to blow swell, also leading to the words pustule and prepus, another word for foreskin. Getting back to the Roman equivalent Mercury, the root sense of his name seems to be connected specifically to commerce, probably being related to words such as merchandise and market, coming ultimately from either the Proto-Indo-European root mark, meaning to grab, or to an Etruscan root referring to aspects of commerce, though another possible connection might be to the Proto-Indo-European root merg, meaning boundary, border, which also gives us the word margin and mark as in a boundary mark. Odin's name, however, demonstrates a rather different association, being related to Old Norse Other, mad, fanatic, furious, and coming ultimately from the Proto-Indo-European root wet, meaning blow, inspire, spiritually arouse, which also gives us the words fan and atmosphere. Thursday, 
Thunristai in Old English and Thor's dagger in Old Norse is named after the Germanic thunder god Thor, and it's not hard to see the connection between Thor and the Roman and Greek gods Jupiter and Zeus, as they are all associated with lightning. Latin dies Jovis, Day of Jove, became French Jeudi and Spanish Jueves. As we've already seen, the names Jove, Jupiter, and Zeus all descend from that Proto-Indo-European sky god Deus, who in the Germanic pantheon becomes Tiwaz of Tuesday. As for Thor's name, it's simply related to the word thunder, from the Proto-Indo-European root stene to thunder that also gives us the words tornado, astonish, detonate, and stun. Friday is Dies Veneris, Day of Venus, in Latin, and Hemera Aphrodite's Day of Aphrodite in Greek, named after the Roman and Greek goddesses of love, becoming Vendredi in French and Viernes in Spanish. We've already looked at the etymology of Aphrodite, and the etymology of the name Venus, from which we get the word venereal as in venereal disease, is pretty straightforward, coming from the Proto-Indo-European root when, to desire, strive for, also source of the words win, wish, and venerate, but also a venom which originally referred to a love potion rather than a poison. However, the Germanic association is somewhat complicated by the fact that there are two distinct but similar goddesses, Frigg and Freya. The goddess who gives her name to Friday, Freya die in Old English and Frau Dogger in Old Norse, Frigg in Old Norse and Freya in Old English, is the wife of Odin, and particularly associated with married love. Her name is similar to, and sometimes confused with, the goddess named Freya, goddess of love and beauty, also connected with fertility. Well, you can see why they might be identified with each other, and it has been suggested that they might originally have referred to the same goddess. Interestingly, the name Freya, only attested in Scandinavian sources, comes from a Proto-Germanic root that means lady, a root that also leads to modern German Frau, ultimately from the Proto-Indo-European root pair, meaning forward, whereas Frigg goes back to the Proto-Indo-European root pre, that means to love, also giving us the words friend, free, and afraid, which means literally out of peace. And finally we come to Saturday, which is Die Saturni, Day of Saturn in Latin. As seems clear from the Old English form Saturnus die and the modern English Saturday, the English didn't seem to have a close equivalent to the Roman agricultural god Saturn, and just borrowed the name instead. Saturn was associated with the Greek god Kronos, one of the Titans and father of Zeus, and also a god of agriculture. The etymology of Kronos's name is uncertain, though many suggestions have been made ever since the ancient world, including the ancient association of Kronos with the similar sounding Kronos, the personification of time, which I suppose does make sense in terms of an agricultural god being concerned with time in terms of the seasons of the year, and the more recent suggestion that Kronos comes from the Proto-Indo-European root scare to cut, since he's often depicted with a scythe not only because of the agricultural associations but also because of his role in the Greek creation myth castrating his father Uranus, the sky, from which we get the later planetary name Uranus. As for the Roman Saturn, he may be a borrowing of the Etruscan god Satra, though the Romans themselves suggested an etymological connection with the Latin word satus, meaning sown, as in sowing seeds, which comes ultimately from the Proto-Indo-European root se, to sow, also the source of the words sow, seed, and season. Now in Old Norse, instead of just borrowing the name from Latin, we find the name Laugardagr, meaning wash day, which, by the way, puts pay to another of those medieval myths that people in the Middle Ages bathed only once a year. There was literally a day of the week named after this activity. Interestingly, in most Romance languages the Latin name was replaced with some form of the word Sabbath, as in French samedi and Spanish sabado, and for the complex etymology of that word check out our previous videos on the topic. So now that we've covered the days of the week, let's take one last quick look at another type of calendar, particularly appropriate to this time of year, an advent calendar, counting down the days of the advent season leading up to Christmas. The tradition of the advent calendar has its foundations in the German Lutheran homes of the 19th century, in which they might mark chalk or paint lines on the floor leading up to Christmas, or hang different devotional pictures on the wall, or light a new candle every day from December 1st until Christmas. Then homemade advent calendars starting appearing around 1850, which included a Bible verse, drawing, or even a suite for each day. The first commercially produced printed advent calendar was published in 1903 by Gerhard Lang, designed by Richard Ernst Kepler, called Münchener Weihnachtskalender, or Munich Christmas Calendar. 
And today, there are many kinds of advent calendars, not only the ones with little chocolates behind cardboard doors, but also online advent calendars, including our own Etymological Endless Advent Calendar on Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, and Facebook. And of course, the advent calendar ends with Christmas, closely followed by New Year's, at least in some calendars, which brings us back to January, where we started this etymological journey. And one thing this journey through the calendar has shown us is how very classical its roots are, and that's fitting given the origin of classical itself. The word class and classical comes from Latin classis, which originally referred to the Roman people under arms, in other words the army or fleet. The underlying sense is a call to arms, as the word comes from Proto-Indo-European kella, meaning to shout, the same root that lies behind Latin calare, to call summon, and thus also the word calendar. And this classically based calendar has been changed and adapted many times to reconcile different gods, religions, and natural cycles of the sun, moon, and seasons. Also fitting since reconcile is another descendant from that same shouting root, coming from Latin reconciliare, to bring together again, regain, win over again, conciliate. From the Latin prefix again and conciliare to make friendly, from concilium, a meeting, gathering of people, from the prefix com, together, together with, and that shouting root, with the notion of a calling together. And the root kella also comes into Greek as kalein, to call, and prefixed with ek, out, as ekalein, to call out, which led to the noun ecclesia, which in classical Athens was the principal assembly of the Athenian democracy, but was later used by early Christians to refer to a religious assembly or the Christian church as a whole, and from that we get the word ecclesiastical, as in the ecclesiastical or church calendar, and Bede's ecclesiastical history of the English people. And with that, I hope this has made the origins of the modern calendar very clear, to draw on another word from the root kella. And if you're celebrating around this time of year, we at the Endless Knot wish you a happy Yule and happy New Year, and a calendar filled with fun and relaxation. Well, I'm sorry to say that, as it turns out, 2020 wasn't a great relaxing Calendar. Calendar year. <laughs> yeah, the end. I mean, we. It, it's not wrong of us to have wished that for people. <laughs> yeah, it just didn't turn out that way. No. I mean, we wish that for you this year too, but I think it's. You wouldn't believe us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, leaving that aside for the moment, that was a lot of material. A lot of etymologies. A lot of etymologies. This was a really heavily etymology, not that much history, comparatively. And also just very long. Hmm. So we're not going to add, or I'm not going to add any more etymologies, you might be. But what I thought I would do is talk about someone that you cited a lot, and something that you cited a lot, but didn't explain in detail, which is Ovid's Fasti. So when you were talking about the months, the Roman months, and the gods associated with them, you cited his fasti quite mm -hmm. a lot, but you didn't really say what it was, understandably. And it's a slightly odd thing. So I thought it would be worth talking about it a bit. And in doing so, talking about, you know, what, what is a calendar? Why do we have calendars? And what does it mean to have them? And, and the Roman calendar in particular. So Ovid's Fasti is a six book Latin poem written by the Roman poet Ovid and published around AD 8. So Ovid is also you know, best known for the Metamorphoses, a long series of stories of Greek myths and Roman myths, and also the Ars Amatoria, like a lot of sexy poems and mm -hmm. exciting poems and entertaining poems. And then he wrote this poem about the calendar. So I sort of want to talk about why. Now the poem is six books. Each book is one month. Now you may note that there are 12 months in the Roman calendar by this point, because after Julius Caesar, there are 12 months. So it's incomplete. It's un unclear whether it's intentionally so or not. It's a big area of discussion because in another poem, he mentions that he's finished all 12 books of the Fasti and then he goes into exile. So in AD 8, he's, he's exiled by Augustus to the Black Sea. And at that point, he seems to have edited and published the first half. But we have no trace of the second half, no mentions of it by other authors, no quotations, no nothing. So it's not clear whether he finished it and never put it out or he didn't actually finish it. Who knows? 
Anyway, so we have six months of it, and it's written in elegiac couplets, and it's didactic. So what that means is that it's not written in the epic meter, which didactic poetry of one type, Hesiod and Lucretius, who write didactic, write in that epic meter of dactylic hexameters. But there's a tradition that goes back in particular to Callimachus, who's a Hellenistic writer that writes in elegiac couplets. So he's kind of going with that. And Callimachus wrote this big, long thing called the idea that was about the origins of things. And one of the things that the Fasti does is it has it's filled with a lot of ideologies, explanations for why places in Rome are called what they're called, why certain rites or festivals happen, why people do certain things at Rome. So there's a lot of that kind of origins of things. So it makes sense in that way that it's it's in the tradition of Callimachus and also of Propertius, an earlier elegiac writer who wrote a book of poetry like that too. It's framed as a series of eyewitness reports from the gods and goddesses involved and interviews with those gods as if he's basically this Roman poet, this Vates, is like interviewing the gods to be like, so why, what, what do you do in this month? And why is this festival held? And would you tell us a little bit about what you feel about these events sort of thing? <laughs> And so they kind of come on stage and explain the origins of Roman holidays and customs and things like that. And it does have humorous bits in it, for sure. So let me give you his own words. I'm going to read the opening from poetryandtranslation.com. This is a translation of the first few lines. I'll speak of divisions of time throughout the Roman year, their origins and the stars that set beneath the earth and rise. Germanicus Caesar, accept this work with a calm face, and direct the voyage of my uncertain vessel, not scorning this slight honour, but, like a god, receiving with favour the homage I pay you. Here you'll revisit the sacred rites in the ancient texts, and review by what events each day is marked. And here you'll find the festivals of your house, and see your father's and your grandfather's name, the prizes they won that illustrate the calendar that you and your brother Drusus will also win. Let others sing Caesar's wars, I'll sing his altars and those days that he added to the sacred rites. And then it goes on and talks more about the addressee. So it's addressed to and dedicated to the heir apparent or one of the heirs apparent. The reason I can never remember who he is is because he dies. Like most of Augustus's household, he dies before he becomes emperor or anything like that. So he's, it's addressed to the imperial family. So the thing I really want to point out right away then is the political aspects of the calendar. This may just be about days of the week, sorry, days of the year and months of the year, but it's not because it's about politics and it's about power. The word fasti itself, the title of the poem, refers to the calendar. It is the word used for the calendars and for the big calendars that are put painted on the sides of walls and that we have some remaining. But it's also the name for the consular lists, which are the lists that are also placed in public spots in Rome that list the consuls for every year going back, you know, as far as they have potential sort of memory of, <laughs> which are important. So those are the fasti. Those are the spoken things. That's really what all of this comes down to. And they're really important because the Romans didn't number their years. Mm. You talk about that a little bit, but you don't get into it too much. They didn't have a number. I mean, they could, they sort of had a one that the historians used, but in daily speech, nobody numbered their years. What they used was the names of the consuls. Right. So that list of fasti is actually the list of time. But it also is the list of all the important families, all the people who've had power, all the ancestors of all the people, you know, who, the consuls are, until the emperor is the most important people in Rome. And they continue to be important because they're, it takes a long time for them to start dating by imperial reign. So the fasti is an, as a name, even of this a calendar, is already a political thing. It's the name of the lists of the magistrates. The other thing that is mentioned in those opening lines that's important, he says, let others sing Caesar's wars, I'll sing his altars, and those days that he added to the sacred rites. And he also says, here you'll find on the events of your house, your father's and your grandfather's name, the prizes they won that illustrate the calendar. So in, in a very blunt way, that's August and July that Julius and Augustus, mm -hmm. though <laughs> they aren't in the half that survives. Right. And people have wondered if that's why he never finished it, because after his exile, he was too bitter against the, the family to publish the, the months that were July and August. Mm. Just speculation, but it's an interesting thing. But this opening makes it sound like they're going to. But even without those, the other thing is 
a lot of a good number of festivals on the Roman calendar. And there were a lot of festivals on the Roman. They didn't have weekends. Like you said, they didn't have weeks, but they had a lot of festivals. A lot of them mark battles. They mark battles in the Republican history, but they also mark, you know, there's a festival on the Battle of Actium. There's a festival, you know, the imperial, the, the important battles. And some of those are festivals and some of them are days that are nefastos, that is unlucky days where right. you can't do business or do anything. So great losses are marked down there. And then under the imperial family, you start to have festivals for birthdays of the members of the imperial family or death days. And up until around Julius Caesar's time, festivals were added over time by the Senate. So the Senate would occasionally get and basically import a new god or mark a new festival because an oracle or the Sibylline oracles or somebody told them like, you know, the gods hate you right now. That's why you have a plague. So they'd institute a new festival to, and then that once, the Romans didn't take things off the calendar. Mm. Once it was on the calendar, it was on the calendar. <laughs> but up till then, it really had been the Senate who did that. But Julius Caesar reorganized the entire calendar. And when he reorganized the entire calendar, something that had been up till then a senatorial power, he then also added in like new festivals, revived festivals. Augustus revived a bunch of festivals that had kind of fallen out of favor. They were on the calendar, but people didn't do them very much. So just the calendar as it was by 8 CE was a really tangible representation of the power of Julius Caesar and Augustus and sort of Tiberius, but really Julius Caesar and Augustus at this point, who had literally been able to manipulate time, who had reorganized it and, and put their mark on the days of the, of the year. So when Ovid tells the story of the calendar, he's not just telling you like, if I told you the days of the, the, the months right now, it might not feel like that was very political right. because we, it is so, though I'll come back to that, it's so much sort of just the fabric of our life, right? Like, especially, you know, the days of our month are counted in numbers, mm -hmm. not in festival days. But if I have a calendar that has all the holidays on it, I mean, you can even see this, like, which, which holidays do you mark? Do you only mark Christian holidays? Do you mark Jewish holidays? Do you mark Muslim holidays? My calendar marks Canadian holidays, but it also often marks American holidays too sometimes because I need to know what those are. That's a, polit you know, th those are political issues. And when you think about it that way and you think about, I read a, a good article talking about how, you know, Caesar's taking over the responsibility for the calendar was taking it over from the elite. So up until Caesar, you talked about those intercalations, right? Mm -hmm. The intercalary months. The thing that happened all the time with that is by sticking in extra days between the end of one consular period and the time when the new consuls took power, or before, you know, sticking in new days before the elections took place, you could actually, if you were the consul in charge, you could literally manipulate it so that, you know, more of your own voters got to the city in time, or others had been called out to war and weren't there, or so that you were in charge long enough to oversee certain court cases that were going to help your friends before you laid down power, you know, because you had essentially like almost two months worth of and because nobody really knew whether or not they needed more days that year or not, you know, mm -hmm. technically you consulted experts and stuff, but like man on the street had no idea. So the people, you know, there was a small band of elite people who were in charge of time, <laughs> in a really real sense. And then that messed up, like you'd be like, okay, I'm going to plant my crops at a certain time, but you entirely reliant on natural signs because the calendar didn't tell you anything. Not only was it all out of whack, but like you might think it was going to be right. And then they'd stick in an extra half a month. And now suddenly you don't know, you know, when is the next market day going to be? When is the next festival day? I want my daughter to get married, but it needs to be on a, on a loud day, not on a nefastous day. But suddenly they added in four more days. And so now we can't get a, she can't be married on that day because now that day's, you know, the mere fact that Caesar established a stable calendar that could go up on a wall that wasn't going to change, that was going to be the same every year. You know, yes, it was slightly off, but really for most people's purposes. And there wasn't going to be any of this random sticking in of new days. That stable, publicly consultable calendar was a political act. And it, to a very real extent, took the power out of an elite group and mm -hmm. made it the people's power or made it shared equally among people. Because now you actually knew when the market days were going to be and you right. knew like when you were going to travel and what was happening and when the elections were going to be. So that that element is, is really so 
Ovid's poem, while it seems in many ways like it's about little, little trivialities, could be seen just in the mere fact that it's celebrating the calendar as celebrating an imperial thing, right? Because the calendar itself had, was a political act to create it. I mean, obviously, it also had this huge tradition and, and it was a very, but, you know, you, you're defining Roman life when you define the calendar. So that was the main point I wanted to make. And, I, you know, I can tie that to now that, you know, the calendar continues to be political. I mentioned holidays. Think about that as like commemorative days that are named or renamed, you know, the quite reasonable fuss over Columbus Day or all the municipalities that love to declare, you know, the, such and such a local day of celebration. Those are all political acts. Those are all trying to inscribe yourself into the calendar, try to get yourself in the calendar. What changes whether you can open on Sundays or not? Like those things are all about social and political structures. And even like the most trivial things like businesses or as we've no noticed recently, politicians sending you calendars mm, with right. their name on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they want their name on the calendar, even if it's just beside the calendar, because the calendar is so central. You know, if they are associated with it, then they're they, they take mm -hmm. on. So that the power of the calendar to sort mm -hmm. of. Is, is still and there. Even, yeah, yeah. It, it, even still, right? It, it does regulate your mm -hmm. your when you're working and when you're on the weekend or whatever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So all sorts of things like that. We're used to the calendar controlling us, but when we don't, I think, often remember how much the calendar is controlled. Mm. You know, the fact that it now lines up with the solar year tends to make it feel like it's an astronomical and therefore natural thing. But of course, it's still not. Like, yes, the number of days in a year that is a natural cycle. But how many months there are, they're not lined up with the moon anymore. So they're not just natural. And, you know, the days of the week, and it's a while back now, but the five day work week mm -hmm. was an immensely political thing to be achieved. The fact that we generally have a five day work week in most countries now, or many countries, it's, that wasn't true 150 years ago, you know? So... So yeah, I think all of those things can, for a long time, the Fasti was considered like a really boring poem and not very interesting and probably not very good either. But mostly people just didn't read it because of so many other amazing things. But I think there's a lot of really interesting things going on in it. And it that also should mean that we also have to take it with a grain of salt when we use it as a source, because especially for things like etymologies, and you know that, I mean, you said that in the video, like, he gives multiple ones and he's giving them and the choices he's making are political choices mm -hmm. as well as literary choices and are not going to reflect necessarily historical reality. But anyone who uses Ovid as a source for anything always has to know that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my piece on the calendar. Well, I'm not going to talk more about the calendar because we don't know actually all that much about early Germanic calendars. But instead, what I'm going to talk about again, relates to sources, and because I do mention a few sources in reference to the various Germanic gods. Right. And so I'm going to talk about those sources and how we know what we know and how we should interpret those sources in terms of what we know about the gods, mm -hmm. the Germanic gods. And the most important thing in, in terms of thinking about sources of Germanic myth is that there is this huge scarcity of information. Right. So most of this stuff doesn't get written down until after they become Christianized. So therefore, you have to take it with a grain of salt that mm -hmm. these are people who no longer believe in those gods anymore. They're the ones writing it down. Mm -hmm. And who are not actively practicing the yeah. rituals and, you know, you don't know at this point how many generations they are removed, yeah. perhaps, from people who were. Yeah. Now, the most well-attested source for Germanic mythology is Norse mythology, but that's all very late. Mm -hmm. And so it's not the same as earlier continental Germanic beliefs. It's going to be different and it's, you know, it's years later. So late, when are you talking about? So the Norse stuff doesn't get written down until what's called the medieval period, when you get into the 12th, 13th, 14th century okay. or later. Whereas the period of Germanic paganism goes back, well, to the second, third, fourth century, you know, it can go back very far. And we have bits of information about that. Mm -hmm. But when you try and line up the Norse stuff from like maybe a thousand years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's slippery. that's slippery. And then you're talking about continental Germanic, but there's also English. Yes. Or British, not Celtic, but the Germanic yeah. English stuff. And that's yet another yeah. set, right? 
So the most important source for Germanic myth in general, and specifically Norse, is the Prose Edda by Snorri Sturluson, who lived from 1178 to 1241. It was probably written around 1220. And it's a collection of myths from Scandinavian religion, compiled in order to preserve them after the advent of Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's sort of a literary purpose because he was worried that people would no longer be able to understand the old references, which are often very elusive. Right. So he wanted, it was like a crib book for old poetry. Yeah. Basically. But he was Christian. Mm -hmm. We have scattered bits and pieces from other earlier Germanic traditions. We also have info from outside of the Germanic people. Mm -hmm. Most importantly, the Roman author Tacitus, who describes Germanic culture in his Germania. So Tacitus lived from 55 to 118 CE. Right. So much earlier. Much earlier. So it's a foreign writer's account of people that were foreign to him, these foreign Germanic peoples. It doesn't only talk about religion and mythology, it talks about their culture more broadly. Mm -hmm. It's probably written around the year 90 CE, and this is the earliest written sources we have of Germanic religious belief. Mm -hmm. So it's an anthropological description of the Germanic people, it's what we might refer to as an ethnography. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have non-literary sources of information. So archaeological evidence, mm -hmm. place name evidence, and later folklore. So for the archaeological material culture side of things, there are things like decorated artifacts, such as swords or helmets mm -hmm. or rune stones with brief inscriptions. There's the English Frank's casket. <laughs> Your um, favorite. <laughs> which has some mythological stories depicted on it. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's not connected with the people, the Franks. It was just at one point owned by a guy named Franks. So it was Frank's casket. That was very disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> As I say, place name evidence is surprisingly important. Mm. So you can look at the distribution of, you know, the places named after whatever particular God. And you can, from that surmise, well, this God was worshiped here or there or and not there. Might have or had whatever. this kind of associations if yeah. they're always springs or if they're always hills or they're always whatever. But yeah, yeah. but it, that's very, can get quite tenuous. Yes. As for those literary sources, in addition to the prose Edda by Snorri, there's the poetic Edda, which mm -hmm. is older than Snorri. There are sagas, lots of Norse sagas, which have you know, sometimes only brief mentions, but brief references are still, mm -hmm. can be useful. Mm -hmm. There's the Gesta Denorum by Saxo Grammaticus, who is a Danish writer. Uh, there's the Nibelungenlied, mm -hmm. which is a German, you know, old, or Middle High German poem. There's some Old English poetry that mentions briefly names, names and stuff, including Beowulf, which, you know, is an important source for mm -hmm. at least some mythological information. But all Old English sources we have are post-Christian, right? Yes. Every, every written Everything. source. Yeah. 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 There are some charms and spells that are preserved, and I'll talk about one of them in a bit more detail. There's, as I say, Tacitus, Germania. There's also Julius Caesar's Gallic War. Right. So he does mention a few things, a yeah. few things in there. And then there are various works by Bede. And so I'll go into Bede in a, in a bit of detail as well. And then, as I say, Snorri is, is the latest, the most recent source, but it's the most detailed. And the most narrative in many ways. Yeah. The one that actually tells, tells stories the whole story. rather than just Because he's trying to explain saying, them. Yeah. 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 So as I say, Tacitus was the earliest, but the thing to, to keep in mind about Tacitus, it's, I mean, it's good that we have something really mm -hmm. early so that we can see, you know, what's changed by later. But the important thing to remember about Tacitus is that he describes the Germanic people as kind of noble barbarians as a counterexample of, in his opinion, the increasingly uncivilized Romans. Mm -hmm. So he has an ax to grind and he uses the Germanic peoples to kind of he makes them sound good in some ways. Also, he makes them sound weird. Mm -hmm. you know, to be just, exotic, yeah. Yeah. Well, and also, as far as I know, he didn't go there. No, we we don't know for sure. We have sure. no reason that, to know that he has any firsthand knowledge. Mm -hmm. He didn't speak to our knowledge. You know, he never says that he spoke their language. Mm -hmm. So anything he knows is from other people or from Germans who spoke Latin or, you know, like mm -hmm. this is, I mean, it's ethnography, but it's armchair ethnography yeah. to a very large extent. So yeah, to, so taking anything he says as like, you would never take anything he says over archaeological evidence, yeah. put it that way. Yeah. But most of the time we don't have anything except him. Yeah. But it's important to remember that he's not good evidence. <laughs> now we mentioned Bede. So Bede, just to 
put it in terms of time, Bede lived from 673 to 735. So he is an English monk and scholar, he's Christian, who wrote many important scholarly works on things like grammar and rhetoric and computation, natural history, church history, hagiography, saints' lives, that sort of thing. His most famous work is the Historia Ecclesiastica Gentis Anglorum, which is the ecclesiastical history of the English people, which briefly mentions some elements of Germanic paganism, mm. but he kind of describes them as sort of devil worshippers because he's Christian. Right. So, yeah. So how much you so that's can... That's not going to really yeah. help you very much with their actual yeah. beliefs, yeah. So as a Christian writer writing for other Christians, when he does mention Germanic religion and myth, he does so to point out the sinful past of the English people. However, he does write that work that I quoted uh, a bit, which is really a book about computation, <laughs> but in explaining the, the calendar, he gives what he, I guess he believed to be true anyways, mm -hmm. about where some of these old Germanic names come from. Right. right. Which is what you quoted. Yeah. yeah. But of course he's writing, you know, years after mm -hmm. anyone actually practiced those religious beliefs and mm -hmm. so... Yeah, and it's How important, it's important it to, to when people, so the people understand when we say he was Christian, we don't mean he was Christian and there were a lot of other English people around who were not. By the time we have English writing, everyone in the culture is like, it is, I don't think we have any evidence for pockets of paganism or anything like that. So not by his time. It's no. important to sort of realize that we're not talking about, you know, some Christians writing about other coexisting mm -hmm. pagan groups or whatever. It, it's the that's really is in the past. I mean, of course there are surviving beliefs and folk mm -hmm. beliefs and stuff, but, but there's no groups of people doing this. So the other thing that I may talk a little bit about later is that there is a period in recorded English history in which there are pagans and Christians living side by side. And that's during the Viking invasions. Right. Right. Because they were different pagan. kinds of yeah. pagans. They're not from the same tradition. Yeah. I mean, similar, but not the same. Yeah. But you know, there's no, no one writing in that place at that time. So right. there's not no direct firsthand account of that interaction right. between Christians exactly. and pagans. So all the writing and is like being done And like they don't know the each South. other's languages necessarily. It's, so it's not like they're, they're in a community where some people are doing one thing and some people are doing another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, just, I mean, there was intermarriage, mm -hmm. but very quickly the paganism dies out because it's usually the mother who is English. And she brings and she, her children she up. Brings her children Christian. up in her yeah. Christian religion. So. Now, charms and spells are kind of interesting. You know, there's some that, that go back a fair ways. There's the Merseburg charms recorded in Old High German in the ninth century. So that makes them a very early source of Germanic pagan beliefs in a Germanic language. So this mm -hmm. is not being written, you know, in Latin or something. Right. This is actually in the Germanic language. Uh, there are also some spells and charms recorded in Old English, such as a poem called Ackerbot or Ackerbot, though now I'm thinking there should be an Ackerbot yeah. <laughs> yeah. on Twitter so whole, that whole... retweets whenever you talk about this poem or something. Or whenever you have the uh, diseases it's got charms against or something. <laughs> yeah, so someone make that happen out there. Someone who knows how to make bots on Twitter, make an Ackerbot. <laughs> No, the, the bot is actually boat, I guess, for like remedy, right. like boot, bootless. That's bootless, which is not yeah, yeah. useless. Yeah. Useless. So it's a remedy for unfruitful land. And it has the line, erke eorthan modor, erke, 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 you know, it repeats her name. So this is some kind of goddess. There's no other reference to this name anywhere else. And Earth Mother is the. It's English probably part. some yeah. So yeah, Orthon Motor, Earth Mother. Yeah. So she's some kind of. Remember, Earth not mother. everyone speaks Old right. English. It's important to translate. <laughs> it's, so it's some kind of Earth Mother goddess, right. but she's that's never the mentioned. Only, that's, that's the only it, reference right. to her ever. It's not cognate with any of the other ones we know. Not, no, yet. there's yeah. no there's no connection that we have. Though there is one intriguing connection in Tacitus, though, you know, <laughs> yeah. as you know, we said that, you know, careful, careful, but Tacitus does mention about the Angli, and that's probably Seems, quite yeah. significant because yeah. the Angli become the English, the noteworthy characteristic of the English or Angli to foreign eyes was that they were goddess worshipers. They looked on the earth as their mother. But he doesn't give a name. No, he doesn't give a name. Is that... Yeah, is Erica? that Erica? <laughs> Who knows? Only the Acrobot knows. 
So I'll talk a little bit about what the Poetic Edda are. The Poetic Edda is a body of Old Norse poems about mythological topics. Its date is highly uncertain and highly debated, mm. as it likely existed in an oral tradition for some time. Now, I think the most important manuscript of it, possibly the earliest manuscript of it, is the Codus Regius, which dates to the 13th century. So very, very late, late. Yeah. compared yeah. to when we think it might come from. But the poems are pre-Christian and possibly composed before Iceland was even settled. So and that was about 870. Mm -hmm. So it could go back very far, you know, to early Scandinavian oral traditions. The, the name of the Poetic Edda is baffling. We don't know exactly why it, why it is that. The word, the Old Norse word Edda means great grandmother. So one suggestion is that it may have been a shortening of something like Edumau or Edda Saga, which would be something like grandmother tales. Mm, right. So, you know, the old stories passed down or right. something. Or they may be connected to the word Other, which means poetry or poem. We talked about that word in a previous podcast episode, the poetry one. I talked about the story about the mead of poetry and all of that. Sure. I, I don't remember which episode number no. it was, but anyways, I, I gave that whole story <laughs> and it's also etymologically therefore connected right. to Odin as well. And so you can go back to that episode to hear that whole bit, or it may mean book from Odi as Odi is the farm where the supposed author of these poems, Simundar lived. We no longer believe that that's the guy who wrote them, but mm. this was an attribution given at at, at the some time, point, at some yeah. point, yeah. And also where Snorri Sturluson spent his youth. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the, the, the word Edda may have been connected to these poems much later. So mm -hmm. that, that yeah, doesn't that need doesn't, to go back. Yeah. In any case, the poetic Edda can be very elusive in nature as, of course, they assume that you already know the stories. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of describing it, you know, poetically and artistically. And just using them as references rather yeah. than, yeah. But they do have lots of references to Germanic mythology in them. So I mentioned the Nibelungenlied. This is a Middle High German epic poem written around 1200. It's based on oral traditions, some of which have their origins in the historical events and figures from the fifth and sixth centuries. Mm -hmm. But obviously, again, written as a as the poem that we have it now, anyways, much later. Mm -hmm. And then I mentioned the Gesta Danorum, the Deeds of the Danes, it means. It's written by Saxo Grammaticus. He lived from 1150 to 1220. And it's a patriotic work of Danish history. So the latter bit of it talks about actual recorded historical figures. It's 16 books long. The first nine books deal with Norse mythology and semi-legendary Danish right. history. Right. Like early Roman history, the yeah. sort of history of the kings and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, the last one is Snorri. I'll go in a bit more detail about Snorri. Just because he has the best name, but also yeah. because he has the best name. So he's roughly contemporaneous with Saxo Grammaticus. He's an Icelander though. And as I said, it was written around 1220. So it's a collection of myths from the old Scandinavian religion compiled in order to preserve them after Christianity comes. So that readers, as I say, can still understand the elusive references in the poetry. Things mm -hmm. like the Poetic Edda, right? Right. It's, it's kind of there to explain the Poetic Edda. Which and it, is why it's called the Prose Edda. Prose Edda, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Or at least why someone at some point called it that. Yeah, because it has this relationship to the yeah. Poetic one. And it includes passages from mythological poems. So there's some poems that get preserved in it mm -hmm. that were well known in his day, such as bits from the Poetic Edda. So rather than being a simple collection of stories, though, it's woven into a narrative of a contest undertaken by the king of Sweden. And so it's got the these layers of nested is so, narratives. It is such it's, a it's, complicated yeah. frame narrative. Like, it is hard to understand, I've got to say. Well, and it has this inexplicable ending. Mm -hmm. So it begins with a rationalization of Norse myths, attempting to explain how these stories came to be in light of the Christian worldview uh, of... That they weren't true. That, that, you know, yeah. Starting from the assumption they weren't true. Weren't true. Why would anybody yeah. have come up with them? Yeah. So it begins with a biblical account and then people lose all knowledge of God and thus invent the Scandinavian gods. It also works in, for good measure, the story of Troy in his <laughs> rationalization. Everyone, everyone has Troy to be connected there. to Troy or else you're just nobody in the medieval world. And there's also, you know, elements of rational scientific observation kind of trying to tie it to 
the natural world and mm-hmm. so forth. A, sort of you hemoristic slash yes. um, yeah. allegorical stuff, yeah. So the frame narrative is this contest between the Christian king Gilfi and the Norse gods, the Aesir. And he asks the Aesir various questions. Gilfi wins if they can't answer. The Aesir win if he runs out of questions. Mm-hmm. So this is obviously representing a kind of conflict between Christianity and paganism, right? Mm-hmm. Got, got that going. Though not one that actually was ongoing at the time. No, right? not by it's his not, time. Yeah, it's not an actual defense mm-hmm. in terms of people needing to be converted or something. Yeah. And as I say, it has this ambiguous ending because he keeps coming up with questions and eventually they seem to get tired of answering them and they just vanish. <laughs> so like who won? So who won? Yeah. In some in- interpretations, that means Gilfi wins. However, it could also be interpreted to mean that the Aesir win and the people of Scandinavia adopt the, the Norse religion mm-hmm. as a result of this. He goes back and tells them all these things he knew and they decide, oh yeah, okay, we'll believe that now. Right. Because he, it, we're told, he goes back to his people and tells them what he has learned. And that title, Gilfaginning, it, it means the deluding of Gilfi. So mm-hmm. that sounds like he was deluded. Right. So no one's certain how to interpret this. <laughs> but it adds this whole extra element to the stories he's telling, right? Yeah. Because now is he, is Snorri even telling like the right stories yeah. or are they the wrong stories or are they carefully adapted so that they are foolish sounding or so that they do match. I mean, there's all the questions about is the Ragnarok story even a real story or, yeah, or, and, or the ending of Ragnarok, is it actually trying to mesh it up with revelation style, yeah. biblical ideas about the ending of the world. Right. So Ragnarok has become the central idea of Norse myth for people now. That's what yeah. you think. And for all we know, I mean, he probably didn't make it up completely. Well, he, he didn't because we, we know it is in the poetic mm-hmm. era. But the, but the details of it and like what happens at the end of it in particular, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. The new world being created yeah. stuff. Yeah, I don't think that's attested outside, yeah. of, so. outside of there. So how does this, what do these things tell us then about the central gods of Germanic belief? Right. Well, it's a polytheistic religion with a pantheon that has some similarities to other Indo-European religions, such mm-hmm. as the Greco-Roman mythology, that seems to descend from the proto-Indo-European mythological base, Mm -hmm. though there is also some evidence that there is a Germanic kind of belief in animism, that spirits inhabit everything. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, is... Not surprising. Yeah, and the Roman religion is Mm -hmm. animistic, so... So the central god, as we have it in these later sources, Mm -hmm. is Odin, as he's called in Old Norse, or Woden, or... Wotan is the sort of reconstructed early Germanic form of that god's name. And as I said, he's this death god with that whole psychopomp thing that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And he's also served by the Valkyries who collect the souls of those slain in battle and take them to Valhalla, the hall of the slain. Mm -hmm. And they are portrayed as warrior women with armor. So he's, he's a war god, but he's also a god of wisdom and poetry. Mm Mm-hmm. Which is not the same as other pantheons. Mm -hmm. And unlike other pantheons, he's not a sky god, right? So Mm -hmm. he's not related to that central, Mm -hmm. like Zeus and and Jove and so Mm -hmm. forth. Uh, So he came from somewhere else. We don't know exactly how. Then I I also mentioned Tyr or Tiu or Tiwaz. He is the sky god, right? Mm -hmm. So he is the equivalent, as I said, to Zeus and Jove, Jupiter. However, the way that he seems to be depicted in later Germanic stories, particularly the Icelandic ones as Tyr, is as a war god, not a sky god again. So somewhere along the lines, he kind of got shifted around a bit. Mm -hmm. And then he becomes less important. So we believe he's probably more important, the supreme god in earlier Germanic. But that's only through reconstruction of what he probably was because of Proto-Indo-European and all the rest of it, not because you have any sources that say Mm so. But he gets usurped by Odin to the point where, you know, in Tacitus, we believe what Tacitus is referring to as Mars, probably, probably represented t- Tyr. But he doesn't give a name. He so doesn't he give a name. No, for sure. Yeah. Right. And so by the later o- Old Norse versions of the myth, even his associations as a war god, he gets sort of mentioned as that, but there's not a lot of stories connected mm-hmm. with him. So Odin's taken on all the war god stuff too. Right. So he becomes less important. Really, he's only has this story about losing his hand putting his hand in Fenrir's, Fenrir's mouth. mouth. 
but he is still somewhat associated with the war, according to Snorri. So Snorri does mention that. But and the putting his hand on Fenrir's mouth that. is presume bravery. Yeah, gives us a link to bravery and strength. Yeah, yeah. So Odin seems to have inherited the qualities of the earlier Wodan, Woden, whatever figure who was a war god, mm -hmm. and Tiwaz, that sky god, leaving Tyr as just kind of a shadow. Mm -hmm. Tiwaz is also, however, associated with law and justice, unlike Odin, who can be fickle and even treacherous at times. So he's got that association. Now, Thor is probably the, has more stories uh, about him than even Odin, or mm -hmm. you know, they're the two anyways that get the most stories mm -hmm. in Norse mythology. So he was very popular for the Norse anyways, for the Scandinavians. His name would be Thunor in Old English or Donar in a reconstructed early Germanic. Mm -hmm. He's primarily a thunder god, thus the association with Jove and Jupiter right. in those days of the week. Tacitus also seems to be referring to him with the name Hercules. So pr yes. probably that's just because he's a big, dumb, strong man with a blunt weapon, right? Yeah. They, they have that well, and, superficial and, similarity. And I mean, well, and Thor, the, you, you say he has a lot of stories. He has stories and they're hero stories. Yeah. They really, like, yeah. they're not, I mean, some of them are God stories, but most of them really aren't God no, stories. They're he goes hero on, stories. On various adventures. He goes on adventures. Yeah. He has, you know, contests and tricks and gets brides and you know like mm -hmm. if he weren't a god he would be we would think he was a hero if we weren't told yeah. very clearly he was so i mean in that sense hercules is the same really i mean yeah. he is a god and a hero i think there's lots of reasons for conflating them but it doesn't tell us anything necessarily no. we don't already know about thor yeah but again tacitus doesn't mention the name the germanic name right he just sort calls of him hercules. calls him hercules so then there is the wife of Odin, Freya, who is the goddess of love and mm -hmm. marriage, etc. And I talked about that complicated connection yeah. between Freya and Frigg and Freya, mm -hmm. who is different. <laughs> and I'll talk about why exactly she's different in a minute. Then there is a god who is mentioned by name, by Germanic name, mm -hmm. in Tacitus, Tuisto, who is said to be the progenitor of all people and gods. Sounds pretty important. Yep. Now, this is kind of interesting. So the name Tuisto means two. Like the number two. The number two, yeah. Twin. As also does the Old Norse figure, Ymir. Right. You talked about this a little bit in Monster. Yes. So what I think the current belief is that this is probably, that there is this tradition of a kind of hermaphrodite god or being which gives birth to gods and people, and you find it in a bunch of traditions these kind of twin mm. gods. Mm -hmm. Note also that his grandson gives the name to the tribe, the Ingaivones, who are known as the Ing. So, you know, there seems to be some kind of connection between all of these. And Freya, you know, that's significant because, as, as I'll talk about in a second when I talk about Freya, mm -hmm. uh, they're twins, right? Freya and Freya. Freya is the the male one. Right. Freya is is the sister, the, mm -hmm. the, the female um, like the Apollo Artemis. Twin. Yeah. And uh, there seems to be this common twin god motif in a lot of different religions. So mm -hmm. there may be something to this Twisto that that's what's being referred to here. Right. Anyways, another goddess, god goddess, mm -hmm. that's mentioned in Tacitus is Nerthus. So that's a Latinized version of the name, but if you kind of Germanized it, it would be <laughs> Nerthus. Okay. According to Tacitus, mm -hmm. Nerthus is an earth mother goddess. Also associated with an island, a sacred grove, and connected to this ritual involving a chariot. Okay. Now, the belief is that there may be, so etymologically, this, this name seems to be exactly the same as Njord, right. the Norse okay. god Njord. At least it seems to be the same name, whether it's referring to the same god is hard to say. But, you know, as I say, the, the island connection, well, Njord is a god of the sea. Mm -hmm. The sacred grove might be a connection that makes sense for Njord. Mm -hmm. uh, the chariot seems to be supported by some archaeological evidence. Right. So there may be some connection here, but, you know, again, it's a thousand years later. <laughs> In a different part of the yeah. world. <laughs> the other thing, though, is that the gender has changed. Njord is male. Nerthus, according to Tacitus, is, is female. So this may be another example of this hermaphrodite god, right? Mm -hmm. This twin god. 
there are certain religions where, like, we get this a lot in Hinduism, where, and there are other places where you have, like, every god is a male and a female. Male and female the Romans yeah. do that because mm-hmm. of their animistic views. Like, there's a lot, there's a whole bunch of sort of really Roman, not Greek gods, right. where there's a male and a female form of every, faunus and fauna or right. whatever. So that wouldn't be so weird. And if only one of them survives into later stories for whatever reason. Right. And it's significant that Njord is the father of Freyr and Freya. Another, so another pair. Pairs, yeah. So it may have just passed mm-hmm. down to the next generation. You even get that in Greek, in Homer. You have Zeus and the mother of Aphrodite in the Iliad is Dione. So uh, Dio and Dione. Right. right. Zeus is just Dio. It's, mm-hmm. it's as if there was a pair, right. brother and sister, presumably, that were the parents of Aphrodite, which is just god and goddess, Dio and Dione. Right. So, yeah. I think this pattern, I mean, I'm no Indo-Europeanist, <laughs> but it feels to me from these five instances I have come up with, <laughs> this may be an Indo-European pattern. Mm-hmm. Well, and Freyr and Freya kind of come to replace Njord in terms of their concerns anyway. So mm-hmm. they're, they're basically the same god. Right. According to Norse myth, Freyr and Freya are also the offspring of Njord and his own unnamed sister. Right. So they don't say that it's the female form of the name, but you know, it is. It may well be, yeah. It may well be. Now, there is a reference in Tacitus to someone corresponding to Isis, the goddess Isis. Mm -hmm. Is this also referring to Nerthus? We don't know. But there is a kind of, I think, a ship symbol that is in common there. So, Or is this a reference to, there's a Frisian goddess named Nehalenia. So could it be connection there? Might be etymologically connected. Again, we don't know. So that is that. And then, of course, there are also less distinct personifications, goddesses such as Night, Nought, mm-hmm, yeah. who is said to be the mother of Earth. Mm-hmm. There's Earth, or Yorth in Norse, Sun, or Sol in Norse. So, you know, there's a bunch of those. Now, another one that is mentioned that is that does come up in some detail in Old English mm-hmm. material is Wayland or Welland, whose Norse name is Volander who is either portrayed as a god or a mortal hero, but in either case, he is the legendary smith Mm -hmm. of the gods. Mm -hmm. And whether or not this represents an older detail that connects the two, or whether this was added by influence of the Greco-Roman tradition, is said to be lame. Mm -hmm. That's a common pattern with smith gods. Mm -hmm. So hard to know how that, you know, that detail, where it comes from. Where it comes from. But it is mentioned, so that's probably one of the ones that you get the most detailed reference in English. English, Right. Because most of the other ones, you've got the name, but you don't have any stories. So yeah, what what do we know about the Germanic pantheon in Anglo-Saxon England? Well, we don't know what early English paganism was like, because we don't have any direct references. We have little more than the names of the gods in the weekday names Mm -hmm. and in, you know, things like regnal lists, Mm -hmm. you know, people have them in their Their uh, ancestry saying that they're descended from some god or another. Yeah. So we get the names mentioned a bunch, but no stories attached to them. So there's no solid evidence in early England of the myths, the stories related to the Norse versions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's very little archeological evidence of the gods or myths in early medieval England. Germanic paganism did continue to be reintroduced into England by the Vikings. So Mm -hmm. there could be some reborrowing of stuff there. But again, no text was being written in the north of England at that time. So it doesn't get recorded. (laughs) Due to the Mm -hmm. invasions. (laughs) And really the pagan gods come to be explained as human beings You know, it's that idea that you said of euhemerism, Mm -hmm. right? The theory that historical and legendary heroes come to be venerated as gods and thus the gods can be explained away as human beings. Snorri himself uses this idea in the Prose Edda. As I say, they're mentioned in King Lists. There also is the genealogy given of Hengist and Horsa, who are the legendary founders of the English people who came over the first to invade. And Hengus and Horsa themselves have also been speculated to have been gods who have become treated as human heroes, legendary heroes. Mm -hmm. It certainly fits the pattern of the twin gods, right? These two guys whose name both mean horse. Mm -hmm. And so it's like the same pattern as Freya and Freya. And horses do seem to have been venerated. There's a kind of a horse cult. Mm -hmm. So maybe they are a reflection of an earlier pagan belief. 
people have speculated on the pagan background of the word weird. You See know? your video. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't get into all of that. Video and podcast on yeah. the word weird. <laughs> we do have the Old Norse Norns, Urther, Frathandi, and Skuld, two of which are etymologically related to weird. We do have in Old English the word os, which means God. It's etymologically the same as Old Norse aus or the Aesir. Mm -hmm. In Old Norse myth, they're the Aesir and the Asinur. Aesir, the male ones. Mm -hmm. Asinur, the, the female ones. These are the chief gods in Norse myth. There's also a separate group of gods. This is something that most people probably don't know about Norse mythology. The Vanir, who are fertility gods. And early on, the Vanir are at war with the Aesir. The Vanir go are, are, are gods of the farming class. And, you know, you could say that, okay, the Aesir are the gods of the warrior class. And so it shows some sort mm -hmm. of historical thing. They were, as I say, originally at war, but peace was made with the exchange of hostages, Njord being the hostage from the Vanir to come live with the Aesir. And thus they become allies. And that story spins out with the whole meat of poetry thing. So mm -hmm. you can go and listen to that previous episode. But people have speculated that the Vanir may represent an earlier pantheon of gods who come to be replaced by the Germanic pantheon. Yeah. There's you know, generations of gods is found is found in, in Greek myth. Yeah. Greek so. myth and Mesopotamian myth yeah. and like so yeah, hard to know. Hard to know. But incest seems to be allowed amongst the Vanir, hence the Njord Nerthus, Freya, Freya. Originally they were married, but in later versions they weren't. And then the sort of third grouping of divine beings in at least Norse myth uh, are the Norns, who are Vrathanthi and Skuld. Now, okay, so that's a general overview of the Germanic gods, and I'm going to take it just one step further. So there's Deus, who is the are father sky, Indo -European? the Indo-European levels. Yeah. Okay. So Deus is the Indo-European sky god, father sky, represented in Tiwaz, Zeus, Jove, etc. Uh, there's also, that name is reflected in a number of other religions. And <laughs> there's the old Irish Dagdai Olor Athir, the, the good god or super father. There was also probably a sun deity, As uh, in the, a male the, sun deity. You mean, you need to say because you're not saying which kind of sun. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> As in the sky, the Thank sun in the you. sky. When you're talking about you know, male father god and then mm. a sun deity, it's not very clear. <laughs> yeah. Because there is this common motif of the horse-drawn chariot. Again, that may be connected to the Hengist and Horsa thing is the idea there. I mentioned Perkunos, and the other interesting connection with that is that Thor's hammer, Mjolnir, is cognate with words in Celtic and Balto-Slavic languages for lightning. Mm -hmm. So that possibly connects Thor to this thunder, this right. Indo-European thunder god. The Proto-Indo-European word for stone secondarily refers to heaven. And so this is why it's thought that Perkunos is, is a god of both thunder, with both oak and stone, mm -hmm. because there's this folk motif of lightning bolt that impregnates rocks and trees, especially oak. And so this, the word for stone doubles up for words for heaven in some Indo-European languages like Indo-Iranian and Germanic, which may be because of a conception of heaven as a stony vault from which fragments might fall in the form of meteorites or may be connected with the stony missiles thought to be hurled by the god of thunder. Okay. I mentioned Hausos the dawn goddess that lie behind Aurora and maybe Easter. And it's interesting to note in this that the Indo-Europeans oriented themselves by facing east, right? Mm -hmm. So towards the dawn, as shown by the fact that the word that means south in Proto-Indo-European was expressed by the word for right, dex, mm -hmm. dexter in, in Latin, for instance. Whereas east itself was expressed by the word for dawn, for fairly obvious reasons, yeah. yes. So Aurora comes from the root aus, as I said, English East, and so forth. And similarly, West was expressed by the word for evening. Mm -hmm. So the sun being behind. <laughs> this is not surprising. <laughs> yes. So West Sparrow, meaning evening or night in Indo-European, and Vesper in Latin, mm -hmm. Hesperos in Greek. 
North, the word north, seems to come from the Proto-Indo-European root ner, meaning under or left, and so it's the source of the Greek word nerteros, lower, infernal. Mm -hmm. So it means both under and left. However, all the Romance languages borrowed the Germanic word for north, so they mm -hmm. lost the Latin word. The Latin word being septentriones, which is a reference to, it's an uh, astrology reference. So it refers to uh, a constellation, the seven plow oxen in the constellations that we know more commonly as the great and little bear. As I said, earth mother goddess is probably somewhere in Proto-Indo-European belief. Mm -hmm. The divine twins we see all over the place in Greco-Roman mythology like Castor and Pollux, and we see it in Vedic mm -hmm. religion, Latvian folklore, there's a reference to uh, the sons of heaven. So it's all over the place in Indo-European mm -hmm. uh, religions, and, and very often they are the offspring of the Sky Father, so they're youthful, connected with, or even took the form of horses, hence we say that Hengist and Horsa be them. might be them. So, and, and they're connected especially with the horses that draw the chariot of the sun. Mm -hmm. So that's as far as we can go though. Yeah. So as we saw, I mean, a number of those gods that are common to the Germanic pantheon and the Greco-Roman pantheons may well be because of uh, a Proto-Indo-European common source for both of them. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it was as comprehensive as one can be on the topic. Yes. Because that's what we have. Right? That's what we have. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's time to, we've moved on to the next day already. It's no longer the solstice. It's true. <laughs> a recording. <laughs> so I think it's time to call a halt to our calendrical discussions for the night. And there's a whole, as Mark said, there's a whole, there's two other videos we will come to at some point to talk about. You've been talking about those things uh, over and over again. And they keep coming up in little pieces here and there. So, you know, we'll, we'll revisit some of these topics and other intervals in future episodes. Okay. So for now, we'll wish you, I don't know quite when you're going to, I'm hoping you're going to hear this over the holidays because I'm mm -hmm. hoping to be done with it. So we'll wish you happy holidays, as happy as they can be, though I know everybody is having, very many people are having to face very different holidays. We certainly are among them. It will not be the same as it normally is, but we send our warm thoughts out to you and let us all collectively hope for a better new year. Indeed. Bye-bye. Bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.elliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.